Now, we are kicking off a new series today. There will be four weeks where we're going to uh, talk about our, our mission, our vision, and our priorities. About uh, once a year, I try to spend a few weeks on just kind of reminding us of what our mission and vision is of the church to kind of recenter us back in on why we believe we exist as a church, why we believe that God's planted us in the neighborhood he's planted us in, in the community he's put us in. And so we're going to spend the next four weeks talking about that, our mission, vision, and our priorities. And, um, and we're going to actually skip Next week, we're going to talk about missions, so we're going to kind of go like VMP, all right? How about that? Uh, but that didn't sound as good as MVP. So we're going to start with our vision this morning because this is, i got to be honest, friends, this is like my favorite thing in the world to talk about, um, that, that if I have the opportunity to speak and, and they say, hey, you can talk about anything you want, like if I'm a guest speaker anywhere and they that you can talk about anything you want, I usually talk about this. Um, and in fact, a couple weeks ago, I got a chance to speak at my son's um, school for their chapel time. And they're like, you can speak about anything you want. And I was like, great, I'm going to talk about this. When I was in, in February, when I went to Minnesota and had a chance to speak at a um, retreat there uh, in, in Minnesota, they kind of left it somewhat open as to what I was going to speak about. They actually told me, like, here's the framework. And I figured out how to work it in so I could talk about this. Because this is what I love talking about so much. The vision of our church, and you see it out on the, the board when you come in and when you go out, and we want you guys to know it well, is our vision, we believe that Jesus has put us here to lift Jesus higher than anything else. And if you're here and you've been here for years and you've been here, you're like, oh, okay, he's talking about this again, right? Because you guys know, like at least once a year, if not more, more than that, I talk about lifting Jesus higher than anything else. And if you've just, are newer journeying with us, You'll hear me talk about this a lot because I really believe this. And, and this is where this um, started for me. It was in Bible college. And in Bible college, we, I had a, a class where um, we had to memorize. It was a preaching uh, or a, a pastoral ministries class. And, and we had to memorize, like, I, I, I forget. It was like 90-some passages of Scripture in, in that semester, like, and not just like one verse, but like passages of scripture. We had to memorize over like 90 of them. And, and then our final was, and this is how awesome our professor was. He's like, your final will be this. You'll sit for like four hours and write out every verse from memory. My hand hurt so bad after that. But what was awesome is that those verses got ingrained. And this is one of the verses that got ingrained into my brain. In John chapter 12, Jesus says this, And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. And when I bumped into that verse, it kind of changed my mindset. Because forever, growing up in 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 the church, but um, through youth group. And then I went to, when, when I was at school and, and trying to become, an, uh, like, to talk to my friends about Jesus, I always had this understanding that I had to make Jesus look cool, right? That I had to make Jesus look good, look appealing, that I had to, like, do, thing, do things that made Jesus, like, attractive to my friends so that they could come to church or they would come to youth group. And then I bumped into this verse where it said, Jesus just said, hey, when, when I'm lifted up from the earth, I'll draw all people to myself. I'll, I'll bring the people. And I started realizing, man, I don't really need to make Jesus look cool. He does a pretty good job of that on his own. I just have to worry about getting him higher than anything else in this world. That I just have to elevate his name and his fame and his renown. I got to get his name higher than anything else. And he'll do the work of drawing people. To himself. And so we've, for about 10 years now, we've had this as a vision of our church is just simply to lift Jesus higher than anything else in this world. And that's great because it, it, it affects not only our whole church, but our individual lives. Because what is true of your individual lives can become true of the church. In other words, this, because we make up the church, we talked about this a few weeks ago in, in our series um, 
When we talked about the uh, day of Pentecost and how the church is made up of, of people. It's not just a building. So here's the thing. The, the, the more that you and I embody this idea of lifting Jesus higher than anything else in our lives, the more that we embody the idea of making him the most important thing, the highest priority in our lives, we collectively as a church lift him higher. And so we talk about this at least once a year. And uh, usually I walk through the Gospel of John and show where Jesus, in the context of where Jesus um, says this verse. And uh, if you want to listen to those sermons where I walk through the John, there's probably about four of them on our, on, on our recordings because I do talk about it almost every year. I'm not going to go that this year. So you can go find those um, and when we talked about MVP last time, uh, we talked through that Gospel of John today. I want to um, walk through the book of um, a, a section of Scripture in First Peter. But before we get there, um, I hope we can all agree, because I think Scripture really backs this up, is that Jesus' primary goal, primary objective, uh, when he came to earth was to glorify God. When I asked a lot of people, hey, why do you think Jesus came to earth? He said, well, they came on earth, you know, earth to die for our sins so that we could spend eternity with Jesus. And that's not wrong. But I think if we were to listen to Jesus from his very lips, where he says through the Gospels, is that Jesus viewed his primary mission, his primary objective on earth was to live for the glory of God the Father. Throughout the Gospel of John, we see him say this over and over and over. And in, in John, when, he, when, Jesus, or when God speaks from heaven, he says, um, Jesus re replies back, I have glorified your name and I will continue to glorify your name. Jesus lived for the glory of God in earth. On all of his life and his death were, were to bring glory to God. From the moment of his birth when the angels declared glory to God in the highest and throughout his life, Jesus always did what was pleasing to the Father. And then in his death, Jesus glorified the Father on earth, having accomplished the work that he gave Jesus to do. And so it makes sense, right, that if Jesus' primary mission on earth was to glorify God, that, and that we are made in the image of God, God, we are to be image bearers of God, then our highest aim ought to be to bring God glory in our lives. That God's glory should be our pursuit. That the praise of his name be in us and through us. And not just when we sing, not just when we are at church, but through our whole lives, that our lives exist to bring God glory. I love that Jesus just showed us how to do that best. I love this quote I bumped into the, this week. The incarnation, that is Jesus putting on flesh, God putting on flesh. The incarnation is not only a revelation of God to humanity, but also a, a revelation of humanity to humanity. In Jesus Christ, we are learning what it means to be fully human. And what it means to be fully human is to bring glory to God with our lives. That is the most natural thing that we can do because that is how God created us. In other words, from the beginning of our days, what most natural, the most natural thing we can do with our lives is to bring God glory. And, and I understand that in our fallen world, like that becomes askew. And from a very early age, all that becomes like masked, right? But that's why in, in moments in life when we encounter God, in the moments we encounter God's glory, our hearts leap naturally towards him. Because when we experience the glory of God, when we experience who he is, our hearts can't help but beat for him because that's what we've been created to do. So what does this mean? What does it mean to glorify God? What does it mean to lift Jesus higher than anything else? We talk about it here all the time. We, we put it on the wall here, on, uh, and we put it in the back of our bulletin. Like, it's everywhere, this, this idea, this vision to lift Jesus higher than anything else. And it sounds good, and it's easy to say, but what does it actually look like lived out in our lives? 
Peter here, um, in 1 Peter chapter 4 is where we're going to settle down today. And in 1 Peter chapter 4, or all of 1 Peter, Peter is writing to a church um, that was living in a time of um, kind of suffering, of persecution. And he's writing to encourage them. But he also, in the midst of encouraging them, is uh, instructing them or, or helping them to be able to know what it, like practically what it looks like to live out their walk with the Lord. And so we, we come in to 1 Peter chapter 4. We're going to pick it up in verse 7 where he says this. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each, as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Who, uh, whoever speaks as one who speaks the oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him, belongs, uh, to him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. This one goal that he says here in the middle of verse 11, right? So that in order that everything, in everything, God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. Peter gives us kind of four points within this, um, within this one uh, section of scripture that, that are like darts that we're throwing at the bullseye in the middle of uh, the target in the middle of the, of the bullseye, right? The bullseye is this, that we lived in order to glorify God through Christ Jesus. And the rest of these are like darts that we throw towards this. So what does he get to? Um, what does a, a church look like that glorifies God? The, the text gives us these answers. The first thing you can write in, we glorify God in the way we live. We glorify God in the way, the way we live. He says this, Verse 7, the end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. It's interesting that Peter would say, right, the end of all things is at hand. Peter, we know, walked with Jesus. And Peter was there when Jesus said that I'm going to go away and prepare a place for you. And when I've prepared a place for you, I'll come back, Right? And receive. Peter was there on uh, the day of ascension when he watched Jesus go up into the clouds, and then the angel say, "Hey, one day he's going to descend like he, like you just saw him go up." Right? Peter was was there. This is fast forward several years. Peter's done ministry. Peter's lived life. He's he's led the church well, and now he's writing to the churches in the in the area of of Asia Minor to encourage. Encourage them, and he says here, which is fascinating, the end of all things is at hand. We've now lived almost 2,000 years since Peter has said that. What gives, right? What, did, did Peter just miss this one, right? Did, if 2,000 years ago Peter is saying, hey, the end of all things is at hand, did, did, he not, did he not know? Well, of course he didn't know, right? Because Jesus even says nobody knows when he's going to return. But what I love, when you read through the New Testament, the disciples, the apostles, they lived with an urgency as though Jesus was going to return in their lifetime. Like, I think kind of reading through the, the New Testament and some of the writings, especially of the apostles, they, they thought Jesus was coming right back. They're like, oh, yeah, he's going to go up, and then like, he'll be back soon, right? And they lived with that urgency that Jesus was going to return, that the end was at hand. And, and if that was true in Peter's day, then it's certainly true today, right? How much more is it true today? That we could say the end of all things is at hand. We, don't, we, we can say that without knowing or speculating when Jesus is coming back. But, but there's a difference in mentality if we were to live as though the end was soon. 
right? Those people who um, sadly are given terminal um, diagnosis, right? Said you have this much time to live. However much that time is that the doctor says, you have this much time to live. What I've observed and what I've heard and what I've noticed and from the mouth of those people say they live differently when they know that, that their time, their days are numbered. Which we all ought to recognize, right? That although we may have not in this room, none of us here, or we may not have received that doctor saying, hey, you have this much time to live. We all understand that that life is fragile, right? That, that life's a mist, that, that we're here today and, and gone tomorrow, right? That, that time is short. And whether or not the, the, the end of all things is near, i.e. Jesus returning, or our, the end of our lives is near, to live with the expectation of that creates a sense of urgency in the way we live. And especially... It ought to create in in us an urgency of bringing God the most glory while we have breath in our lungs. That our lives would, would count for something bigger than just ourselves. I, I told this to the group of, of students at um, at Caleb School when I when I spoke there this last week, and, and I think I've said it to you guys too before that if we're living for our own glory, we're shooting too low. That our glory is too small a thing to live for. Your glory is too small a thing to live for. Live for the glory and the fame of Jesus because that's how you make your life count. That's how we make our lives worth more living with an urgency that the end of all things is near. And so he says, therefore... Because of that, because we have a different mentality about life, be self-controlled and sober-minded. Peter likes to use this idea of being self-controlled and sober-minded. He uses this idea and and this phrase sober-minded a few times in his letter. If we jump back to verse uh, chapter 1 verse 13, he says, "Therefore, with your minds ready for action, be sober-minded and set your hope completely on the grace uh, be brought to you the revelation of Jesus Christ. What is this idea of being self-controlled or, or, or sober-minded? I think it's this idea of, of being well-balanced. He's not talking about necessarily uh, alcohol here. He's talking about a state of mind. It, what I've noticed over a period of time and just experiencing life, right? It's easy to, to live in the highs or the lows of life, right? That we either ride really high or we ride really low. And it seems to me that people and we just kind of ping pong back and forth sometimes between highs and lows and highs and lows. And, and, and we have trouble kind of regulating I think one of the things that sober-minded people can do, self-controlled people can do, is live, um, not live in the extremes, but live with a well-balanced faith in God and a steadiness knowing that, that our life is secure in Jesus. When it comes to lifting Jesus higher, glorifying in God in our lives, it matters how we live, how we conduct ourselves, how we walk out this faith. It's not enough just to speak with our mouth and sing with our mouth and and say with our mouth we believe in God or we belong to God or that even that we want to lift Jesus higher in our lives. When it boils down to it, how we glorify God is is shown in, in how we live it out. We walk in our walk with God. We go back up in First Peter chapter 4, jump to verses 2 through 4, which is right before the text that we read earlier. It says this, 
So as you live for the rest of your time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. I love that he says, hey, as you live this thing out in the flesh, right? I heard one pastor say it this way, as you live out life in your meat suit, right? Don't live it for yourself. Don't live it for the passions of of just this life. Uh, don't, don't live it as though you belong to yourself. Don't live it as though it's for your own glory or for your own fame or you're for your own renown. Don't live for human passions, but rather for the will of God. For the time is past, uh, for the time that is past suffices for doing what the Gentiles want to do. Living in sensuality, passions, drunkenness, orgies, drinking parties, and, and lawless idolatry. With respect to this, they are surprised when you do not join them in the same flood of debauchery, and they may malign you. It's interesting. That he says this right before he, he says what we read earlier and what we're talking about today. He says, don't live for the human passions like, like, the, like the rest of the world do. When he says the Gentiles, he just means the rest of the world. And the rest of the pattern of the rest of the world is just to live in whatever feels good right now, do it. Whatever makes you happy, do it. Whatever, whatever you think brings you momentary happiness, make sure that you do that because life's all about you. And that's what, what Peter's writing is, don't, don't live that way anymore. Don't live for that. You, you live differently now. Live in such a way that the rest of the world says, what is your deal? Because you're not joining, like you're not doing what you used to do. That's one of the biggest witnesses that you can give in your life is just live for the glory of God in your life and how you live your life. So that people are like, man, what's going on different with you? Why are you, why do you seem actually joyful, not just momentarily happy? Why do, you, why do you walk through circ hard circumstances in life differently than everybody else? Why is there something about the way that you conduct yourself that just seems different? And then you have an opportunity to point people to Jesus. You have an opportunity when you lift Jesus' name higher than anything else in the way that you live your life to then have an opportunity to speak it out when people ask. And then he, he says there in, in, in verse 7, he says, so that be self-controlled, sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. We do all this so that we can pray. The reality is we can't have a relationship, a healthy relationship with God or any, anyone else if we don't take time to connect with him. But it's interesting throughout all of scripture as, as you read. And, and, and friends, I don't even really know how it works. Like I, I haven't figured this, this piece out yet. I don't know if there, it is to be figured out. But there, there's something in scripture and there's something mentioned again and again that the way that we live, the way that we treat people, the way that we interact with people, the way that we live out, it affects our prayers. It affects the way we communicate with God. It affects the effectiveness of our prayers. And, and again, this may be one of those mysteries that, that we don't get to know on this side, but, but what I do know is that God cares about how we live. God cares about how we, how we conduct our lives and that our lives point people towards him. And when we do that, we have the opportunity to connect with him even deeper. The second thing you can write in your notes, not only do we glorify God in the way that we live our lives, but we glorify God in the way that we love. In the way we love. Verse 8 says this, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. That last phrase, love covers a multitude of sins, is a quote from Proverbs chapter 10 and verse 12. Now, Peter, he wasn't a trained theologian. In fact, if you read Peter's writings, he says, you know that guy Paul? He says a lot of really confusing stuff that I don't get. 
That's, how, that's kind of Peter, right? He's like, I'm just, I'm just a fisherman, man. But here's what I do know. I spent time with Jesus. I walked around with Jesus. I heard Jesus preach. I saw the way Jesus interacted with people. And you know what I noticed? Man, Jesus loved people. And, and, and what he told us, Peter would say, what, what he told us over and over and over again, what he wanted us to know more than anything else, is that love, loving people, really, really, really matters to God. And that we can't live our lives and we can't glorify God in our lives if we don't love people well. If we don't take care of people Verse 8 even says, like the first right, above all. That seems pretty, like, high on the priority list, right? When I read above all, I'm like, that's not something I can bury down below some other priorities and be like, you know what, if I get around to it, right? No, when he says above all, he's meaning like, this is the most important thing you can do. This is the most important way you can show God's glory. This is the most thing, the most important thing that Jesus kept talking about is that we have love for one another. In fact, what did Jesus say, right? He says, a new command I give to you that you may, that you should love one another. By this, all the world will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus says, when somebody came up and said, what's the greatest commandment? Jesus says this, love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. All of the rest of the law and the prophets hinge on those two things. Jesus always brought it back to love. And so what he's saying is you can, you can do a lot of great things. But if we're not loving one another well, we're not lifting Jesus' name higher than anything else. But here's the deal, that's hard. <laughs> because people have differences of opinions and people are hard to, people, let's just be honest, right? And you know this from your just life experience, right? People are sometimes hard to love. Sometimes you're hard to love. Some, I know I'm hard to love, right? <laughs> and so, 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 so when we start bumping into those things and we start rubbing lives with other people and rubbing shoulders with other people and getting involved in people's lives, sometimes it's like, man, I, that person's hard to love. And, and, and sometimes we think it'd be just easier to just, to just not, right? To just write people off or to, to, to just not get involved with people's lives. But if we're going to follow Jesus' command, we're going to have to love one another. And that's going to be tough. I love what C.S. Lewis writes in his book, uh, the, the Four Loves. He says this, To love it all is to be vulnerable. Love anything, and your heart will certainly be wrung and possibly broken. If you want to make sure of keeping it intact, you must, never, uh, you must give your heart to no one, not even an animal. Wrap it carefully round with hobbies and little luxuries. Avoid all entanglements. Lock it up safe in the casket or coffin of your selfishness. But in the casket, safe, dark, motionless, airless, it will change. It will not be broken. It will become unbreakable, unpenetrable, unredeemable. The only place outside of heaven where you can be perfectly safe from all dangers and distresses of love is hell. What C.S. Lewis is saying is a lot like what Jesus is saying. He's saying, I, the way of love is the way of God. And that's not easy. In fact, Jesus would probably tell you more than anybody else, hey, I loved deeply. And it didn't work out very well for me at some points. But was it worth it? Absolutely. Love is risky, but it's what Christians, what, what God, uh, Christians and Jesus followers do. We glorify God when we love one another. Ephesians chapter 4 says it like this. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as in Christ God forgave you. 
This is what it's going to take in order to love people. Being kind and tenderhearted and forgiving and forgiving. And where love abounds, it's easier to overlook offenses. Have you ever noticed this? The people that you love deeply, it's a little bit easier to overlook some of their annoying things, their, their annoyances, right? I'm crazy about my wife, right? Just crazy about her. I love her so much. And there's things that she does that if anybody else does them, they annoy me so much. But when my wife does them, I'm like, eh, it's all right. I'll work around it. It doesn't bother me as much. Because love covers a multitude of, of sins. It covers a multitude of offenses. When we learn to love people, I mean really love people, it's easier to give them the, more, the benefit of the doubt, right? It's easy to say, well, they... That may have hurt my feelings, but it didn't, they, they didn't mean to. It's easier to work through things when you have deep, strong, affectionate bonds with one another. I'm not saying that we um, sweep things under the rug or that we don't deal with things or that we avoid conflict at all things. I'm not, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking, we, telling that we sweep sin under the rug or cover it up or ignore it. But what I am saying is that if somebody is that we, if somebody has um, sinned against you or, or if somebody has hurt your feelings or the worst thing that can possibly happen in our society today is that you are offended by somebody, that we love that person and that that love drives us towards that person, not away from that person so that we can begin the process of reconciliation. That passage that, Peter was referencing in, in Proverbs chapter 10. This is the way it says in Proverbs 10. Hatred stirs up strife, but love covers all sins. The way of lifting Jesus higher than anything else, especially in the church, especially in this body of believers, especially as we gather together, because I know this, I know this without a shadow of a doubt, that sometimes people in our church, when you work with them, they annoy you. You know why I know that? Because you tell me. <laughs> right? I, I, know that, I, I know that there people get their feelings hurt. I know your feelings have been hurt. I know that I've probably hurt your feelings. Right? But here's what lifting Jesus higher together looks like. It looks like working towards one another. It, it, it looks like pressing in rather than pressing out. It, it looks like, like allowing Love to cover a multitude of sins. It means forgiving one another just as in Christ God forgave you. That we treat one another with Christ-like love and compassion as we move together. Because when we do that, when the church figures that out, friends, that screams to the world that we are followers of Jesus. What did he say? By this, all the world will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Not just that you like one another, but do you have love for one another? And that means moving towards one another. Man, that glorifies God when his people do that. Number three, we glorify God in the way that we show hospitality. The way that we show hospitality. Verse 9 just pretty simply says this. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. This is one of the finest expressions of love is the extension of hospitality. Hospitality is... Um, It kind of became a lost art over the last few years. <laughs> As I think um, coming out of 2020 and, and in, into 2021, right, um, that's, what, that's what got lost a lot 
is the idea of hospitality of loving one another, of, of, of living life together, of inviting people into your home and going into other people's homes, to eating together, to being together well. And that's something that we desperately need to grow back into if we want to glorify Jesus and lift up. Because if we look back, right, um, this is what made the early church explode more than anything else was hospitality, was their love for one another and their, their gathering together. They're growing together and not just in churches, right? They didn't necessarily have church buildings like we think of church buildings. Sure, they met in temple courts, but a lot of where they met, a lot of where they hung out was in the home was opening up their home. In fact, we talked about this a few weeks ago when we talked about the day of Pentecost. There was a lot of people that came into the city of Jerusalem and, and the people there, the believers, they just opened their homes to people to live and to be there. That's why I'm excited about um, for, for, you, for the ladies at, uh, for this summer for Gather and Grow because you're going to one another's homes and you're spending time in homes with one another because that's where hospitality really has an opportunity to grow and to blossom is when we sit around with one another. It's not that we just sit in, in, in rows looking one direction. Uh, we, we said this before, this was a couple years ago we did, when we did this, maybe it was the, oh, it was the table series. I remember this, right? The table series says that, that rows are okay, but circles are better, right? That rows are okay, but circles are way better. And when we gather together in circles, it, it, it's better than when we just sit here like this. And that's what hospitality is. It's gathering in circles together. It's doing life together. And what it, it, it means is that it's a mindset shift. It's a mindset shift that we, that, we, um, that we press into. It may involve going out to dinner, getting together for playing games, watching a movie together, watching a sporting event together, having a cup of coffee, sitting around our homes, fellowshipping and talking about the word of God. It, it may be in a, in a discipleship group or more simply just, just being together and whatever that looks like. And here's the crazy part. When we do that, we don't even know the blessing that's around us. In a, in a strange little passage in the end of Hebrews, where the writer of Hebrews is kind of dumping all sorts of, of information, cramming it together, where he's just saying little, like, one-verse statements. He, the writer of Hebrews says something very interesting. Verse 1 and 2 says this. Oh, I didn't write it in here. It's just right here. Keep on loving, uh, keep on loving uh, each other as brothers and sisters. And then he says this in verse two. Don't forget to show hospitality to strangers for some who have done this have entertained angels without realizing it. And, and I just have to add this in. If you've been a, in Christianity for a really long time, all of a sudden you have newsboys starting to come back into, into your brain. Some of you got that. Most of you didn't. It's okay. That was just for us. Um, but, but fascinating little passage. He says, hey, gather, like, as you entertain people, as you, as you host people, as you show hospitality to people, you don't know what kind of blessing you're around. You, you don't even know the amount of blessing it can be to love people. And you know what's crazy about hospitality, the word hospitality? It actually means the love of strangers. It doesn't only mean, I don't, it doesn't only mean hanging out with the people you like to hang out with. It means loving all people well. It, mean, it means loving the unlovely people well. And Peter's modifier here, extend hospitality, <laughs> this is funny, without grumbling. <laughs> I don't know what was about, I think Peter added that in of like, oh yeah, by the way, don't grumble about it either, right? Don't begrudgingly do this. Right? Oh, man, I guess we got to have some people over because, you know, pastor talked about it on Sunday. Right? Oh, okay. Uh, no, he said, don't, don't be grumpy about it. 
When you're, when, you're, when you're loving on people, when you're inviting people into your home, when you're going, don't be grumpy about it. Let me give you some practical ways we can do this. Don't worry, I'm speaking to myself as much as I'm speaking to you. Be open for interruptions. Man, in life, we always have a plan, at least I do, of my, how my day's going to go. Sometimes hospitality, sometimes getting interrupted to show hospitality can be so hard for me because I've got a plan. And I don't, when, when presented opportunities, when, there's inter, when, they're, when they're interrupting my already established plan, I don't always do the best at allowing interruptions, allowing those opportunities to be uh, hospitable. And so I just keep moving past. Be open to interruptions. Make it your goal to let people know that you're glad to see them. When, it, when we have a, this plan in our back of our brains and we're trying to accomplish so many things and we're so busy all the time, sometimes we can treat people like they're inconveniences. I think one of the things that Jesus probably did better than anything else as he walked around and was, was around people is he's, he allowed people to interrupt his, his plan and he made them feel the most special. Like, the, like that they mattered. And we can, we can emulate Jesus in that. Invite people to your home or for dinner or, or for a cup of coffee or, or accept an invitation to go to dinner. Because as we talked about a few, last year in the series The Table, a lot of amazing ministry Jesus did around tables. And a lot of awesome opportunities we have to connect with people happen around tables. It's because circles are better than rows. And also when we eat together, we, we just, there's a bond there. Allow, allow meals to be a place where you um, practice hospitality. And then let's remind ourselves to just do the simple things, right? Sometimes some of the simplest ways we can show hospitality or just love for people is the simple ways of holding a door, uh, of carrying a package, of speaking a kind word, of encouraging people. In, in our daily lives, one of, the one of the ways we can lift Jesus higher than anything else is by showing love to people is just by being open and hospitable without being grumpy about it. And when we do that, we glorify God. And the fourth thing you can write this in, we glorify God in the way that we use our spiritual gifts. In the way we use our spiritual gifts, uh, num uh, verse 10 and 11. As each of you has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's various, uh, varied gifts. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies. The Bible teaches us that, that we have been given a gift from God. And what we need to understand is that we have been given, that, that everybody has been given a spiritual gift as each has received a gift from God. That God's blessed you in some way, that God has gifted you in some way. Um, and, the, and the Bible says this over and over and over, that, use, that we have to use whatever gift we've been given to be a blessing. Because when we do that, we lift Jesus' name higher than anything else. Your gifts, the things that God has blessed you with, the spiritual gifts God's given you, what, they were not given to you firstly for your own benefit. They were given firstly for the glory of God that may, he might be displayed in your life. Secondly, to bless other people. And third, whatever it is that you receive from them. You're, the, the, our, uh, the gifts we've been given were given to us lastly for us, for our benefit. Primarily for the glory of God and for the blessing of other people. And God's given everybody a gift you have a gift, and it may look completely different than, than other people's gifts. But, and sometimes it's easy to like write off our gifts as like, oh, that's no big deal. But God's blessed you so that you can be a blessing. God's blessed you so that you can glorify him in whatever it is that you do best. Some of you have musical ability, and so you can use that to glorify God. With that. Some of you have been given the, the ability to teach. 
gifts. You can teach the scriptures well, or you, you can um, teach others well. Some of you are given a mechanical or a, a gifting or, or um, skill to build. You can use that to, um, to build and to bless people's life and to glorify. Some people have given, been given artistic skills so you can express creatively the love of God. Some people have been given um, just the gift of being a servant, a servant's heart. And you can bless God and bless others by ministering to people who are hurting. Some of you have been given abilities to work with technology, and, and some of you have not. And those who have can bless those who have not. <laughs> and sometimes God puts those people in the same relationship, right? Um, but you can bless people by, by just the ability that you have to tell people to turn it off and turn it back on. <laughs> But I think about all these gifts, and I could go through, like, some of you have been gifted, and you love working with students and teenagers, and you could, God could use you to, to help. Some of you have a heart for missions, and, and so um, to help on the mission field. Some of you have been given even athletic ability so that you can glorify him in the way that you um, interact with people uh, on the sports fields. Some of you have been given interest and, and, and a gifting in, in the area of politics. And boy, do we need you in, in, in our world to make an impact in, in the political world. God's given each of you a gift. And you know what's so fun for me to sit up here and actually just kind of look out as I, as I know Many of you, I, I've seen how God's used your gifting to bless his kingdom. I, I spent the last, I've spent, I think, th three full days of the last seven with, with Scott. And I've just got to watch him as God's used Scott's ability to build and construct things as he's been working on the sheds. And, and we've gotten to work together. And I see how God uses his excellence and his mind and his engineering brain. To, to bless the church, not just the sheds, but that's just what I've seen. And, I, and I've seen, um, I've just seen how God's been working through him. I see how Eric, God uses Eric on a weekly basis with his understanding technology and cameras and live streaming and, tech and, and social media. And he's, all the things that, that happen, I see God using him in, in, in amazing ways to make this happen. On Sunday mornings, I see a lot of you in here who are teachers, um, who teach our kids on a weekly basis and rotate through. And there's a whole crew of people right now out here serving in, in, in teaching our kids about Jesus and the love of Jesus, and using their spiritual gifts that way. I see um, our, our students who have been blessed and, and with, with different musical abilities or the ability to to um, teach as well, you realize that most of our students here at this church, most of our kids in youth group, they're serving in some capacity, using their gifts for God's glory, right? I see this morning as I watched as Jason was back with us to lead and God using his ability to, to lead a team of people to help us worship God. I see our musicians and how God's blessed them. I see those of you in here with a gift of encouragement that every Sunday, um, I'm just encouraged by, by Jeff and Melanie and, and Jason and Peggy every Sunday as they come in and Phil and Marilyn. Um, just, I mean, I, they encourage in my soul so much when they, even just through greeting me, but, but, but they encourage me. They've got the gift of encouragement. And, and all of you, I could go around, I see as God's just blessed you to be a blessing, to build his kingdom. God's gifted you for his glory, first and foremost, to be a blessing to other people in his kingdom, secondly. And then whatever it is you do with that after that is just the benefit. All of that, what Peter says, we use deliberately to glorify God in our lives. Because he says this, right? Whoever speaks is one who speaks the oracles of God. Whoever serves is the one who serves by the strength that God supplies. In order that, in everything, all of life, God may be glorified through Christ Jesus. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. May this be the anthem of our church and of our lives. 
that we live for the glory and the fame to him be the glory and the dominion forever and ever in our lives and in our church. Because we will say this over and over, you'll hear it more than, than just today, but we believe as a church that we exist for the glory and the fame and the renown of Jesus Christ, to lift his name higher than anything else. And that's the most important thing we can do as a church. So my challenge for you is this, in your life, in your life, what does it look like to glorify God today? To glorify him with the way you live your life. To glorify him in the way that you love. To glorify him in the way that you show hospitality. And to glorify him in the way that you use your spiritual gifts. Because each and every single one of us are tasked, are given the, the amazing privilege of living this life. Not for our own glory, but for his. What does that look like for you? I'm going to pray and then we're going to sing a song. Um, and I just want you to use that time as a reflection. We're going to sing the words, it's your breath in my lungs, so I'll pour out my praise. I, I, I want you to view that not just that it's your breath in our lungs so that we'll sing this song in this moment. But we'll, you'll use whatever breath God's given you in your lungs to pour out his praise with all of your life every day of the week that you live.